My gentle and of course very modern apes, I've got some interesting news for you here today because paleoanthropologist of South Africa, Lee Berger, dropped something of a small bombshell on Twitter when he released his Carnegie talk discussing some recent news on a hominin called Homo naledi. In his presentation, Lee revealed some pretty compelling support for the idea that Homo naledi utilized fire which is of note because Homo naledi's brain case size is at its largest half of the size of modern humans. Why was this small-brained hominin utilizing fire in the Dinaledi cave system? And how much does brain case size really matter when we're talking about the cognitive abilities of some hominins? That's what we're going to talk about today. try to keep this video relatively short simply because we don't have a lot of information to go off of outside of Lee's presentation at Carnegie. It would be my preference to do this video once we actually have a publication, but I don't know when that publication is going to come out. I suspect it's going to be soon, but I don't know that for certain. So what I'm really going to do is just explain what we know and maybe give a few of my opinions, really restricting myself until we have more the full picture in the form of a, of a peer-reviewed publication. And this seems to be the impression that I'm getting from a lot of paleo Twitter. There's a lot of paleoanthropologists who are kind of saying, cool, I'll let you know what I think when we know a little bit more. Uh, but one thing that I think is fairly for certain is that there was someone lighting fires in Dinaledi Cave, and I think it's probably Homo naledi. So why is this a big deal? What is Homo naledi anyways? Homo naledi was a hominin discovered by Lee Berger and his colleagues in 2015, or I should say that's when it was reported on in sort of a major way. This hominin was discovered when local spelunkers in South Africa came to Lee and basically said, hey, we, we think there might be something of note down in that cave, maybe you should go check it out. And classic story goes, Lee could not fit into the chamber. In fact, no one could fit into the chamber except very small individuals. And so Lee put out sort of a, a casting call for individuals who were small enough, you probably mostly female individuals who were capable of actually fitting into the cave, getting down there to see what was up. And lo and behold, when the sort of recruited paleoanthropologists got down there, there were fossils everywhere. And critically, there was only Homo naledi in this chamber. There were no other animals in the assemblage. This caused Berger and colleagues to come up with a very specific idea as to how they think that they got down there, and this relates to sort of the fire usage that we'll touch on in a bit. First, let's appreciate what this cave system actually looks like. So this is what the cave system looks like, and as you can see, uh, it's a tight squeeze. Here's our little silhouette of Lee Berger or some ambiguous person up here. There are a few separate entrances over here in the side of this small hill that heads down to the Superman crawl where you got to get basically on your chest and shimmy through towards this next open chamber, climb up the back of this dragon's back, squeeze down this chute, and you're finally in the Denaletti chamber or my cursor is currently hovering over. And then there's a little person in there to again show you the size of, of the chamber itself. It's tough to get back there. And what's crazy is that they didn't find like one or two individuals of Homer Naledi back there. They found the remains of 15 individuals, including some really nice skeletons. So this is a sort of famous picture of the assemblage from the Dinaledi chamber specifically. As you can see, we've got a lot to work with here. This is really, really nice. 
uh, for hominid assemblage, especially because it's it's only home in the Leti, which is very strange indeed. And the composition of individuals in this chamber is all over the place. You have males, females, the old, the young. It, there seems to be no bias, as there typically tends to be in a lot of other assemblages, that tend to be made up due to either some kind of water deposition or maybe predator assemblages where predators are bringing the animals to a specific location and feeding on them there. And you would expect to have sort of a bias towards older or younger individuals, specifically not the healthy, you know, sort of middle-aged ones. And yet we've got them all here in Dinaletti Chamber. The total number of skulls that we have that we can get a decent idea of sort of cranial capacity is I think it's three males and two females, and the cranial capacity range specifically is like 425 to 620. That is like barely outside the Australopith range, which is of huge note to us. Uh, it dips a little bit into, it's, it's sort of overlapping with early Homo habilis or with Homo habilis in general, but outside of the range of Homo rudolfensis. So this thing looks a lot like early genus Homo. This is really cool, right? The rest of the body is interesting as well. The feet look just like, you know, Homo sapiens, um, smaller. It's the classic, you know, bipedalism evolves first. So it's really what we would expect. The lower limbs are going to be very derived. The pelvis looks a little bit more like an Australopith. The hands are a dead ringer for later genus Homo. The arms and the shoulders are very ape-like, as is the uh, sort of thoracic cavity, the chest. And the face is also very derived. It's flatter. It's not as prognathic as something that, that you might see from an Australopith or from something from Paranthropus or even earlier, much earlier, the Miocene apes. And yet the brain case is small. So what the heck is going on here? The teeth are also pretty derived, but they suggest a more ape-like growth rate. This thing is like a perfect hodgepodge mosaic. And, you know, some of these bones are in articulation with one another. We're found in articulation, such as the hand kind of gripped like that. So we know that this is all from a single species. But what the heck is going on here? Where does it fit, right? When Lee first discovered this thing, when the, his team and his team first discovered it, the, the idea seemed to be being thrown around that this thing might be at the base of genus Homo, perhaps a better candidate for uh, our eventual radiation than something like Homo habilis. And, you know, you can kind of see why, right? Here's one of the skulls over here. The, the middle portion of the face is missing. Uh, another sort of group of cranial material. And, you know, here's what we think they probably looked like, which is, you know, there's liberties taken here with the amount of uh, sort of fur cover, fur and face cover, fur and hair cover, excuse me, on the face. Um, but as far as like muscle placement and the overall shape, uh, it's pretty hard to mess that up. There's only so many ways that you can put uh, muscle on bone. But that being said, this thing is kind of an enigma. And then the dates came out and the dates for this thing, right, of Homo naledi when they were dwelling in that cave are 230,000 years ago to 323,000 years ago. It's recent. This thing lived contemporaneously with Homo sapiens, right, at the same time and potentially even humans could have been living uh, in the same area. So this animal is kind of like this odd late surviving offshoot of things. There's no denying that it is a member of genus Homo. It's got a lot of characteristics that sort of diagnose the genus, and yet it retains a lot of primitive characteristics as well. And the brain is small. So that begged the question, how did they get into that chamber, right? How could they have been intentionally buried there if their brain is only slightly larger than an Australopith who for all we know, did not do any kind of intentional burial. And to take it a step further, that's exactly what Berger and colleagues proposed in 2015, that this was an intentional burial. So on September 10th in 2015, this first paper comes out. I only say it's first because it's the one that actually describes the new species, uh, Homo naledi, a new species from the genus Homo from Denaledi Chamber, South Africa. And in this one, they talk about how it's a new hominin characterized by body mass and stature similar to small-brained uh, or small-bodied, excuse me, human populations, but a small endocranial volume similar to Australopiths. So it looks like early Homo in the body, and it looks like late Australopithecus in the head, in the brain case. The cranial morphology is unique, but most similar to early Homo. So the face looks like Homo habilis, Homo rufensis, early Homo erectus. While primitive, the dentition is generally small and simple in occlusal morphology. This is sort of cusping of the teeth. 
Uh, Hominaledi has human-like manipulatory adaptations of the hand and wrist, so derived hand and wrist, just like I said, but a human-like foot and lower limb. These human-like aspects are contrasted in the postcranium with a more primitive or oscillopith-like trunk, shoulder, pelvis, and proximal femur. So the proximal femur is sort of the on-top portion of the femur that uh, holds the trochanters, has the trochanters, and the head and neck of the femur, and sits inside the acetabulum of the pelvis. They say representing at least 15 individuals with most skeletal elements repeated multiple times is the largest assemblage of a single species of hominins yet discovered in Africa. And in this paper, they show a lot of cool pictures. There's the classic one we already saw. There's some of the cranial material, more cranial material, some mandibular stuff there. There's the hand, it's like a dead ringer for a human hand. There is the proximal femur, the tibia, the foot, right? That's also like a dead ringer for a human foot. That just looks like a foot that a person would have. They do a really cool comparison down here with the endocranial volume. So based off of one of the skulls that they have, uh, you could kind of estimate what the brain would look like seated inside there. You just CT it and, um, and estimate based off of the endocast, sort of a virtual endocast. And that's what it looks like. So Notice here, the frontal lobe isn't huge. The frontal lobe is of course important in like executive function, critical thinking. Occipital lobe is in the back here. It's nothing to write home about. This looks like an Australopith brain, really, really and truly. And they do a really cool comparison down here with the, I think it's a little bit, well, maybe actually it was back up there. Hold on. I know it's in here some, okay, sorry. I scrolled right past it in my excited haste. So they're comparing the first molar buccolingual diameter. So basically they're looking at the, it's like the width of the tooth. Buccolingual refers to the, the cheek side to the tongue side of the first molar and comparing that with the endocranium volume here on the y-axis. So up here is like middle Pleistocene homo in Africa and Europe. And as you can see, they got big brains, 1100 brain size uh, in CCs. And then we have, or sorry, in milliliters. And then they have Homo erectus, they have Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, and all the way down here with like lining up with really derived Homo in the teeth and yet smack dab in the Australopiths with brain size. It's a weird, weird critter. And um, that's really what they talk about here. They're just talking about the diagnostic characteristics of Homo naledi, what it is, why it's interesting, why it's cool. But if you scroll to the very bottom, they link you to one of the companion papers, Geological and Taphonomic Context for the New Hominin Species Homonaledi from the Denaledi Chamber, South Africa. So you can pull that up. Luckily, all of this is open access. It's one of my favorite things about Lee Burger is that he loves open access science, and I do too. We share that goal. And in the abstract for this paper, which Lee is also on, but he's not the lead author, uh, Dirks is the lead author. They say, we describe the physical context of the Dinaledi chamber within Rising Star Cave, South Africa, which contains the fossils of Homo naledi. They talk about how many were there. They talk about how it's effectively only macrovertebrate fossils um, of home, being Homo naledi, like all of the big fossils are Homo naledi. Essentially, all of the fossils are Homo naledi. They say, this chamber was always in the dark zone and not accessible to non-hominins. It basically explaining why only hominins are there and making a note that this is not a predator assemblage. And... On that basis, it's going to be pretty difficult to make the case that it's like a it's like water carried material. Why only hominins if that's the case? They say bone taphonomy indicates that hominin individuals reach the chamber complete with disarticulation occurring during or after deposition. Hominins accumulated over time as older laminated mudstone units and sediment along the cave floor was eroded. Preliminary evidence is consistent with deliberate body disposal in a single location by a hominin species other than Homo sapiens as uh, at an as yet unknown date. So they still didn't have the dates, but what they said here, it's intentional burial. And people reacted harshly to this. The reason I think is pretty easy to understand, right? They're arguing that a hominin with half the brain case size of a human managed to shimmy down into this very strange cave system that evidently had no evidence of sort of geological reworking. So the case is being made, at least in that original 2015 paper, that it looked more or less like this, and that they just did it without light. Or at least they did it without, they did it, period, and we don't have evidence for light yet. And a lot of paleoanthropologists thought that was jumping the gun in a major way. And so they reacted pretty harshly to uh, Lieberger and his colleagues here. Uh, generally speaking, the consensus was that 
intentional burial here was more on the outlandish side, not necessarily like fringe or anything, but people were really holding their breath saying, well, let's see if, you know, there is evidence for a tool that could have helped them get back there. And that tool is, of course, fire, because it's pitch black in these caves. It's not just the difficulty of manipulating or sorry, navigating uh, and manipulate your body through the Superman crawl and through the you know, the shoot up the dragon's back. It's being able to see while you're doing it, right? And in 2015, we had nothing of the sort, no evidence for fire whatsoever. Of course, now all of that has changed. But before the evidence for fire was discovered, and we'll talk about what that evidence is, Lee and his colleagues explored a lot more of Denaledi as a cave system. Right, so it's actually really big. The Rising Star Steve system is kind of large, right? So Dunaletti was the primary one. It's reflected here, so we saw it reversed in the in the previous picture. But they also got the Lissetti chamber, and there was more individuals discovered there as well. The biggie for the Lissetti chamber was this guy right here, LES1, presumed to be a male with like a 610 cc brain case size. So on the upper end for our Homo naledi as a species range, but it's also a male and these guys are thought to be like 20% sexually dimorphic. So it could be an artifact of that as well, or just a particularly large individual. There were other finds here and there, the Leti skull, child of darkness and others, but more or less everybody's been holding their breath waiting on this big find that Lee has been hinting at on Twitter. And lo and behold, last week it, finally came to light. He posted his Carnegie Hall presentation, and in that presentation, he tells a story. A story about how he lost a lot of weight so that he could get into the Denality cave system. And while down in the caves, he was tired, sat back, and found himself gazing up at the ceiling where he saw soot, ash, on the ceiling of the cave, which is very noticeable because this is calcium carbonate cave, so it shows up very starkly up against the, the, the normal colored stone. And he explains how he effectively races back to go tell everyone else. And like coincidentally, one of the other colleagues who was working in there that day had uncovered a hearth. You can see in the background here from the presentation, this is the hearth. It's, it's little, it's not huge. We have our scale there to the side so you can see precisely what we're looking at here. Uh, but it's a little guy. And you see that and you're like, but that's, definitely like charcoal there, right? This is definitely a little pile of something that was burned. But Lee wasn't finished because right next to that little dinner plate sized hearth is this significantly larger hearth. And both of the hearths contained burnt animal bones. Lee goes on to note that there's a clear distinction between these rooms that we're finding these hearths in, because you'll come to find out there are more than just these two, and the rooms that contain Homo naledi. In the rooms with the hearths, they tend to have burnt animal bones that are not Homo naledi, and they don't contain Homo naledi in them, in the rooms. And in the other rooms, we do have the presence of Homo naledi and no burnt animal bones. So we thinks to himself at this point in the presentation, we gotta check these other chambers out. We need to relook at the entire cave system with this in mind. And you can see there in the background, that's what it looks like to get to some of the other chambers. Specifically, they wanted to look at the Lissetti chamber next, which Lee describes as being like ultra remote, as in Dinaletti is difficult to get to the Dinaletti chamber within the Dinaletti cave system. Lissetti is like, is extreme, it's an extreme version of that. And so they get back to the main Lissetti chamber, which Leah's described in the past as being like pristine. There is no sign of, you know, human activity there or anywhere else, but really Lissetti has been like untouched. It's It was really discovered primarily by this team or at least fleshed out by this team. And there they find stacked rocks. Uh, what's notable about these stacked rocks is that that gray at the bottom there is ash. It was used as like a little fire pit and poking out from the bottom of the sort of, uh, lower rocks out from the ashes, more burned animal bones. This is in an area that like humans had not evidently characterized prior to some of this in-depth surveying by Lee and his team. And if that's not convincing enough, Lee says, which I would say is kind of funny, but, but also true, uh, you get this. This is like in the same area, it's like a mega hearth. It's like a big area burned 
uh, animal bones that also acts as like a refuse pile. So like um, discarded bones were thrown in here. It's like a, a pretty impressive looking uh, snapshot, if I do say so myself. And like all over this section, they're finding burnt animal bones, regular animal bones, and this piece of charcoal. Like this is an example of one of the many, many, many pieces of charcoal that is being scattered about. And charcoal is of course burnt wood. So that's a lot of information to take in. It was a lot for me to take in. What on earth does it mean? Well, we can say for sure that someone was using fire in this cave system and in all likelihood it was Homonolani. The only reason I'm not saying like guaranteed guaranteed is because I, I don't have the paper, I haven't seen the methodology, but if it truly is the case, as Lee says, that we can make a one-to-one -one comparison about you know, where these hearts are found, being within the same strata as where we're finding Homo naledi in the same sort of layer, I really don't see any reason, in, in any other context, we would, we would link these two. I think it's appropriate to do so. But that's so weird, right? This is Homo naledi. This is a, an animal with a 425 to 610, 620 cc brain case size. And classically, there is at least an association with brain case size and cognition. This is true. However, it might be that that correlation is perhaps less important, the correlation between brain case size and cognition, than the wiring of the brain is with cognition. And that large brain case size is, of course, important, and it does map relatively with the intelligence of a given animal, but there's probably more to the story. There are a couple of questions that I have right off the bat though that I really wanna get out, right? I, again, I don't wanna to get too into this. I have a lot of thoughts. I wanna keep it kind of constrained because I, I really wanna read the material once it is available to me. One, how are they managing these fires so deep in the cave? My concern about initially was about like, how is how are we getting the smoke to flow out? Is there enough, I guess, oxygen to keep the fires lit? Are they pulling the wood in there with them? Are they dragging the animal carcasses in there with them? It makes me wonder if perhaps, and I don't know for sure because I, I've, I've seen a lot of talk about this on Twitter from the folks who kind of specialize in the South African fossils. I wonder if there isn't a, an easier entrance than what we've sort of been, been shown so far, the way that they're getting into these chambers today. I wonder if there isn't an easier way to get to these chambers um, that would have allowed, that would have more easily facilitated this kind of behavior. Another thing that's very strange to me is that where are the stone tools? This is the exact opposite condition of what we see in another late surviving, small-brained member of genus Homo, that being Homo floresiensis, the hobbit, three and a half foot tall, um, sort of dwarf hominins living on the island of Flores, you know, is within the past 100,000 years and indeed far, far further back into the past, but like comparatively, even recent compared to Homo naledi, right? And these guys, we don't, have definitive fire use assigned to them, but we do have stone tools. So it's like an it's like a flip flop that what we're seeing uh, with the Letty. It wouldn't surprise me if we ended up finding fire for Homo floresiensis and stone tools for Homo naledi. And for whatever reason, the context that they're being researched in right now um, doesn't facilitate that kind of discovery. Maybe maybe that's down the line. But I find it very interesting that we're finding burned bones with no cut marks, burned bones that aren't crushed by rocks. They're just they're just in the fire. They're just getting chucked in the fire. See what happens. I also wonder what Hominolidi was doing living in these caves. Obviously, hominins living in caves is not unusual. The word caveman exists for a reason. But typically, we don't tend to associate late Australopithecus or even early Homo with actually dwelling in caves. So I I'm curious as to what, wh why? Why the caves? Is this ubiquitous for the species? Is this a simple population that's chosen to live in this cave. I don't know that we're going to, to find that out, at least until we can find another spot where Homo naledi can even be found. Right now they're they're isolated to this extremely uh, fruitful location in, in Denaledi Cave. But I'm curious as to that. I would be very interested to see if some of the other hominin sites in the area, like Sturkfontein, maybe contain Homo naledi at some point. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure those places have been scoured, but it's just something to think about amusing as you can tell just because I'm like getting getting my thoughts off the top of my head. There are some other things that I wonder about too. Like we offhandedly suggest kind of that some of the Homo naledi material was intentionally even placed. Like it wasn't just a we throw our dead in here, but it was a we 
we place our dead in here in very specific ways. And that leads back to the, the whole point. Like, does this vindicate Lee's 2015 paper? Does it vindicate the idea of intentional burial? I don't know, but I'm inclined to say yes. I'm inclined to say it does look like they were putting their dead there. We have the fire. We have the way for them to, to see in the dark. I do think that the current maneuvering through these cave systems might be a bit difficult, but again, it wouldn't surprise me if we end up finding out that there is another entrance in. Of course, I'm not like super familiar with the cave system itself, so I could be wrong. I might get blown out of the water in the comment section here. I East hom East African hominins are, are what I'm more familiar with, but it wouldn't. I'll just say it wouldn't surprise me. What does surprise me, however, is a statement that Lee makes later on in the presentation. Like, Lee kind of implies that this indicates a culture that separates Homo naledi from every other hominin, except Homo sapiens, or maybe Neanderthals. And to that, I, I heavily disagree. Fire use is documented in hominins other than Homo naledi, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthals. We know Homo erectus utilized fire. I just did a video last week or two weeks ago about how we found cooking sites associated with Homo erectus. So not only did it use fire, but it wasn't just chunking refuse into the fire, it was actively cooking it. It was choosing the temperature at which to allow food stuffs to get before pulling it out of the fire and eating it. We also have suspicions that some earlier members may have utilized fire, although I think those are pretty unfounded. As of now, Homo erectus tends to be the first uh, hominin credited with fire use, at least like like unambiguous, I guess I should say, fire use. But that being said, like if we're talking about culture too, well, chimpanzees have culture, right? Chimpanzees have a culture. They teach their young how to utilize tools in their environment with arbitrary rules dependent on where the um, community is living. Right? Some communities utilize certain stone tools in a certain way and others utilize them in a different way. I also did a recent video about this. It's the same with the, the plant material that they utilize for termite fishing or the six they might use for different tasks like sharpening and skewering bush babies. That's culture, no different than the culture that Homo naledi is exhibiting, right? It's, it's the use of tools to manipulate the environment around you that you then teach others, particularly your offspring, how to do. And I think really what Lee is kind of saying without necessarily saying it is that there's some kind of like ritual, almost spiritual, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but that's like my interpretation on, on the talk um, that, that might be going on here. I think that he's got something up his sleeve. In fact, I know he's got something up his sleeve because he tweeted it. Like just two or three days after the Carnegie uh, presentation was put out there on Twitter, Lee tweets this. So, he says, I have a terrible, shameful admission. The fire. It's not the big discovery I've been tweeting about. There's a bigger one. Actually, there are three bigger than fire coming. Sorry. What? He's such a tease. That drives me crazy. And, like, I understand why he's doing it. He wants to drum up, you know, um, attention and hype and get everybody excited in a good way. And um, he's, he's got me, right? Like, I'm hooked. I want to find out what's going on. Um, what, what does he have? I, I think, I hope that it's DNA. I don't think that it's DNA, but I, I think the, the climate in South Africa is not very conducive to that kind of preservation. I would wager it's probably some kind of artifact that you could perhaps extrapolate an understanding of symbolism or ritual from to kind of take that back with, with the implications that I feel he was gently putting out there earlier. So, okay, final thoughts. And I apologize if I seem kind of like off the cuff here. I am very off the cuff. I mostly watched the presentation, got my thoughts together, and I was like, okay, time to make the video. Or I guess I watched it a second time. I've, I've seen it twice. Like I watched the night it came out and then I wanted to watch it again for this video. But again, like I'm very hesitant in saying too much outside of just my, my questions because we don't have a paper yet to really evaluate. We just have the presentation. Not that that's bad. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I think Lee is very good at drumming up excitement for his work. He's a good speaker. I know he, he can be a little controversial in his methods. Like I know a lot of people on Twitter were really wanting to have the paper right away. I'm going to stay out of all that because people have their opinions. I'm just mostly excited about the science. So my final thoughts on all of this. I think we can pretty well definitively say Homo naledi used fire in the Dinaledi cave system. 
but the fire's not dated yet. Once the fire is dated, we will be able to definitively link it to the population that we've previously discovered there, right? So we're waiting on those dates. But that being said, it's a very strong association and in any other area, particularly given there's no other hominids there, I think that it's fair to say Hominoleni was the one utilizing the fire. So we can say all of that. Questions though. Is there something ritualistic going on? I don't know. It, it will least you know, hyped up future discoveries, are they going to validate this idea that there's something more than just fire use going on to kind of prompt him to imply that this culture is different? Two, how are the fires staying lit? Is there enough oxygen? Is there enough airflow, enough oxygen to keep the fire lit, but not too little ventilation to choke out the hominins that are lighting the fires from smoke? Three, how did they get the fires in there that deep? Is there another entrance or did they really lug themselves, their dead, their food, and their wood to these spots um, through this convoluted sort of passionate way that we're taking today. If we have DNA, how is this going to relate to Hominoleti's placement amongst the rest of the hominins? I know Lee Berger's opinion, I've seen it on Twitter, so I feel comfortable saying it here because Twitter is obviously public, and I actually concur with Lee's opinion here. He supposes that Homo naledi is an offshoot from early Homo, something like Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis. It doesn't descend from like Erectus, it descends from something probably a bit earlier, which may explain why it retained so many primitive characteristics that seem to have been lost in Homo erectus. It just kept them, it didn't like regain them, they just never went away. This is what some are proposing for Homo floresiensis as well, that you get like Homo habilis 2.4 to 2.8 million years ago, splitting off and going to Flores and going to South Africa, which is not that difficult to do in the South African sense because we get these green highways coming and going that would have facilitated hominin movement from the east to the south in bursts, right? Because that highway isn't always there. The climate is changing. We, we know that for a fact. We see the Sahara cycle between being dry and being lush. Likewise, these green highways down to South Africa appear to have cycled. So where does Homo naledi fit in? Can we really say that it is as distant as being an offshoot from Homo habilis? Or could it be an offshoot from like Homo erectus, something more recent? And guys, if we get DNA from this thing, we're opening up a big gate here, a portal to potentially some of the characteristics that earlier hominins might have had. And this might be our best shot because these caves are pristine and they're cool. So perhaps they could have preserved the DNA better than you know typical environments there in South Africa that tend to be pretty destructive to DNA. And finally, I'll say, I think this discovery is really, really cool. It is fascinating. It is elucidating. I don't know that I'm like jaw on the floor about it. Like, I think it's more like, okay, that makes sense, right? Because before, and I've done this in conversations on this very channel, I've kind of mused that like, all right, I don't think it's burial because they don't have any light. How are they getting in there? How are they getting back out? Are they feeling their way along the walls? But I'm happy to say that with the light of this new data, I think it's a reasonable case to make, right? If new data comes, we can change our minds. I think that's the best part about science. I said that a lot on this channel as well. So you guys, I'm gonna leave you with that and we will revisit this topic the moment we get some data to actually analyze. Um, I, again, I love the talk, but I really want something more to kind of sink my teeth into. So my gentle, of course, very modern apes, please take care of yourselves. And if you enjoy what I do here, consider supporting me on Patreon or via Super Thanks. Actually, I don't think I have that turned on. I'm gonna turn it on via Super Thanks um, because it, I really appreciate it. It helps me keep the channel up and running. I get a mortgage to pay and TA gigs do not pay very much. So um, consider that if you'd like. And I will tell you that we got some stuff coming up. We got some cool stuff coming up on this channel. I'm excited about it. I got like, five different big videos kind of in the works. So I'm excited to share those with you. If you've noticed that the content has been rather short and kind of spread out recently, that's probably why. So I will see you soon.